Um, so thanks everyone for joining and we, we have a, mostly Okami users here, also some other people. And uh, the talk today will be given by Brad Chamberlain, who is the principal engineer of Chapel. And Chapel is an open source scalable parallel programming language um, that was pioneered at Cray and I think now at HPE. And um, for, for during how this is working, we have a separate Slack channel. Um, all of you can access that. It's called Chapel Webinar for the Q&A session because there will be hands on um, session so everybody can either use the Zoom or use the Slack channel, whatever you, you prefer. And with that, I'm giving it over to Brad. Great, thanks very much. Um, thanks for the introduction, Eva, and thanks very much for the invitation from the community to give this webinar. Um, it's nice to have this opportunity to reach out and tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Um, as you've heard, I'm Brad Chamberlain. I'm the technical lead for the Chapel Project and one of the founding members. And um, today I'm gonna spend the webinar talking a lot about Chapel in general. I'm assuming that most people in the audience either don't know about it or maybe are sort of behind the times on where we are with it. And then I'll have a little bit of uh, uh, discussion about Chapel on uh, Ukami specifically. And I'm probably pronouncing that machine name wrong. I looked it up online beforehand and only found robots trying to pronounce to me probably equally yeah, incorrectly. Yeah. Okami. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so um, this will be a couple hour webinar. Um, we will have some time for some hands-on or live demos. Um, and I also really want to encourage people to ask questions. I know that the virtual setting is difficult for audience members to kind of retain attention and difficult for speakers to know how the audience members are doing. I'll try to pause frequently for questions, um, but please don't hesitate to interrupt me or if people notice things happening in the Slack or chat that I'm not aware of, um, you know, feel free to call those out to me as well and interrupt. All right, so uh, kind of my teaser for this talk um, is sort of, you know, imagine you have a parallel, program, a parallel programming language for HPC that was as programmable as Python. And in saying that, I don't mean to imply that Python is like the perfect language or the end all be all, but I think, you know, it's not hard to look around and see that Python enjoys a lot of popularity, um, particularly among younger programmers, particularly in the mainstream. And that it's because of a lot of benefits about being easy to read code in, write code in, um, good tooling, good libraries, things like that. And so to some extent, I think there are aspects of that experience we wanna reproduce. At the same time, of course, you know, Python really isn't fast or designed for HPC. And in fact, has some pretty big liabilities for that. And whenever you see someone running a fast Python program, typically what's happening is the fast part's written in something else and they're just using Python to interoperate with it, which is totally fine and great. Um, but the point is, you know, Python's got a long ways to go to become sort of an HPC language. But how do we get that programmability, but then get the other goodies that we expect in HPC? So we want sort of scalar code that's as fast as Fortran, which I think for a lot of people remains kind of the fastest. Um, something that's as scalable as MPI or Shmem, so you can run on the largest scale systems and get great performance. Something as portable as C in the sense that, you know, you can just know that you can run it anywhere without worrying about it. As flexible as C++, and flexible is maybe not the right word here. I'm never quite sure which one I want, but think of it as sort of that ability to define your own types, extend the language within the language, kind of build things out, um, build sort of big code architectures, if you will. And another one I threw in here uh, for this talk, type safe is Fortran C and C++. So, you know, one of the great things about Python is it's dynamically typed. You can sort of whip code out very quickly. But one of the downsides is because it's dynamically typed, things can go wrong, you know, way deep into your run. And of course, in HPC, that's something that's um, typically not acceptable, I guess I would say. So, you know, we want to be back on the sort of statically typed, compiled type of language. And then the last one here gets kind of smirks, uh, sometimes the HPC community, um, which is as fun as your favorite programming language. And I think in HPC, we sort of have this attitude that like, well, HPC is not about fun, it's about suffering. So you can get great performance, right? And, um, but the point is, I think a lot of us get into programming because we consider it to be fun. And I think one of the reasons we have trouble attracting and retaining people in HPC is because the software aspect of it is kind of, again, I think for a lot of people, something you grit your teeth and get through and you get really exciting results as a result of it. Uh, but the programming experience itself isn't all that much fun. So we'd like to put some of the fun back into programming, if you will. All right. Um, so what is Chapel? Chapel is a modern parallel programming language. Uh, it's a language designed to kind of address those sweet spots on the previous slide if we're successful. It's portable and scalable. So uh, it runs pretty much everywhere from 
you know, my Mac laptop that I'm giving this presentation on onto the largest scale HPC systems with commodity clusters and cloud-based systems in between. It's open source and collaborative, so we're developing it at GitHub. Um, and like any good open source project, it has contributors from our user community, from the open source community, um, from other companies sometimes. And then the two main goals of Chapel at the highest level are to support general parallel programming, which you can think of is if I have some parallel algorithm in mind and some parallel hardware I'd like to run it on, I ought to be able to do that in Chapel or we're not meeting this goal. And the second goal is to make parallel programming at scale far more productive than it is today. It kind of relates back to my previous slide, but let's look at productivity in one other aspect. Um, so when you talk to people about productivity, I think it's one of these terms that can mean very different things to very different kinds of people. So just going through a few profiles, uh, when you talk to recent graduates or current students, you know, for them, what's productive is probably what they used in school, which, you know, depending on what their field is and where they're coming from, might be Python, MATLAB, Java. I'm probably totally out of date as to what students are actually learning these days. Um, and then if you talk to people in HPC, uh, the HPC space, their reaction is kind of like, oh, that's that sugary stuff that we can't use because we need full control to get good performance, right? We spend a lot of money for this machine. We expect to get great performance out of it. And whenever we use something productive, like all the performance goes out the window. So, you know, to a lot of people, I think productivity and performance are sort of um, inherently at odds with one another. Whereas we think that the right uh, productivity uh, features and abstractions can actually both help your programmability and your performance. And then if you talk to computational scientists, or when I do anyway, um, mostly what they say is, look, I just have scientific ideas I want to explore. And I like I know enough about parallel programming to be dangerous and to be able to get some things done, but I don't want to wrestle with a lot of architecture specific details. And I don't want to change my code whenever I move from one architecture to another uh, specifically. So the chapel team's answer to productivity is kind of a blend of these three things. We try and design language that lets computational scientists express what they want to without taking away the control that HPC programmers need. That's all implemented in language that's as attractive as a recent graduate would, you know, would want based on their background. So that's a, you know, another view of what we're trying to do in terms of productivity. So speaking of the chapel team, uh, this is a team effort. So I'll be doing most of the talking today, although we've got a couple people on the line who will help out with um, hands-on session, things like that. Um, but we're currently at 19 full-time employees plus the director, and we're currently hiring. So um, if you uh, know a student or a colleague who's looking for a job and would be good at implementing a parallel language for HPC, please send them our way. Uh, but this is a team photo of the current team. And you can see more about our team and other contributors at the link here. So with that, let me uh, lay out the outline for what I hope to do today. You know, this is kind of the worst uh, talk time, right? Two hours is sort of long enough that you're not gonna practice it and see whether you're on time or not. Um, and it's long enough you can do some really interesting things. Uh, but yeah, I have no idea how much or how little we'll get through today. But here's kind of the plan. Um, I'm gonna start out with just some, well, I've given you a little bit of you know, what is Chapel at a really high level? And next, what we're going to do is get into some motivation for Chapel and some use cases. And then I'll give you an introduction to Chapel. And this is probably where we'll spend most of the presentation time today. Um, this will give you sort of a, a high level tour of the language features. And it will be high level. Chapel is the kind of thing you could spend a day or multiple days um, sitting in tutorials, getting really expert at. Today, I'm going to give you just enough knowledge to hopefully uh, help you understand what we're building and make it interesting to you and give you the skills that you can do some hands-on exercises if that's of interest to you. Um, then maybe a live demo, I'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, then I've got this section about Chapel on Okami, probably still pronouncing that wrong, um, just talking about some of our initial experiences there. And then at the end, I'll have some summary and resources um, for people to use after this, after today, and uh, hands-on at the end. Now, the question marks on the demo and the hands-on I, I hope not to just talk to you for two hours. I think that would probably get old. So kind of the three things we can do to break it up are, number one, you can ask questions as we go, which again, I encourage people to do. Um, I don't mind being up, interrupted at all and would, would rather be if, if people have questions. I think that livens things up. The second one is we can take a break here in the middle, kind of do a live demo where I'll do all the typing and sort of keep people from having to um, you know, get Chapel installed and such, but sort of maybe we can just sort of see some code uh, happening live if, if you know if people are interested in there's time there and then again sort of times permit time and interest permitting um, we're set up to do a hands-on session today if that's of interest to people um, and again we'll just kind of see how it goes play it by ear I'll mention here that uh, all these slides and the hands-on materials and the chapel installation 
um, will all persist past today and I'll make the slides available. So don't feel like you have to be scribbling things down. And in fact, I've preloaded the hands-on area with a lot of the code examples from the slides. So um, if you see something in slide, you can make a note of it and look for it um, during the hands-on or afterwards. So before I go on uh, to chapel motivation uses, uses, let me just pause and first of all, make sure that technically things are working okay. Um, and also just see if there are any questions so far. Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear, Brian. So. Okay, great. And then any questions? No, but I, I'm already voting for a mini hands-on so I can at least uh, get to the point where I can run it. So. Okay, we will hope to get you there. All right, the, um, the one other thing I'll say at a meta level here is, you know, in Seattle, it's almost always cloudy and rainy at this time of year, and we're hitting the middle of the day, and it's actually not cloudy today. So at some point, there's going to be glaring sun in my face, which is fine for me, but uh, I apologize. I know it's a, a bad look, probably. Um, anyway, if there are no other questions, why don't I go on to Chapel's motivation and uses? So a lot of times when we talk about Chapel, particularly in the HPC community, you get this sort of withering, like, why are you creating a new language? Like, I think people just have really negative impressions about uh, attempts to create new languages. And so this is my, my answer to that. Like, why are we even bothering? And the main answer is that we think that parallel programmers deserve better, particularly at HPC scales. So the, start of, the state of the art for HPC programming, if you really think about it honestly, is essentially a mishmash of libraries, pragmas, and extensions mixed in with languages that were really designed for serial, serial programming to begin with. And at the same time, when you think about what are the very most important things about HPC programming, it's about parallelism and locality, right? Um, to us, these are concerns that deserve first-class language features and all the benefits that those entail. And yet, in most languages, they're sort of, again, tacked on through these various extensions that aren't really part of the language necessarily. And happily, um, we're not the only people who think this, even though we sometimes feel like we're in a minority. Um, but uh, here's a great slide from a talk that Kathy Yellick gave at our annual workshop a couple years ago now. Um, it was called Why Languages Matter More Than Ever. And basically what she was arguing is, you know, with exascale and the complexities that are coming along, like languages are simply going to become more and more important. And in her talk, she sort of argued that there's sort of four main areas that matter. There's syntax, semantics, performance, and algorithms. And, um, you know, at a high level, you can think of this as helping you express your code more clearly and in a way that the compiler can help optimize it for you so you're not always doing everything manually, and in a way that um, clarifies your code to the extent that not only is it clear what your intent is to the compiler, but to other readers and to yourself so that you might explore algorithms that would never occur to you uh, to try out in conventional techniques because you're just too busy just trying to stay afloat all the time. Um, so it was a really good talk. Unfortunately, we don't have a recording of it, but I like to quote this slide, which actually I saw early in my career and it was very motivational to me then. So I was happy she brought it up again in, in 2018. Um, and the other answer for why we're creating a new language is frankly, because existing languages don't meet our needs. It's not as though we think like, oh, just a minor tweak to an existing language would sort of get us where we need to be. We sort of think there would need to be major breaking significant changes. So that's why we're not just doing like a C++ extension or a Fortran extension or a Python extension or something like that. And that's not to say that those aren't reasonable ways to go in more of an evolutionary style. Um, we just think to get where we really want and need to be, we need to start from scratch. That's what we did. All right, so when you start from scratch, uh, you might ask the question, well, what should a productive language for HPC support? And I think there are kind of two parts of this answer. There's sort of traditional stuff that you would want from any good language, and then there's stuff that's uh, specific to HPC. And so on the traditional side, you've got things like you want it to be easy to program and easy to read the code that's been programmed, um, to be portable, to get you good performance, to have good abstraction, interoperability. You can imagine this list going on and on. And kind of the point here is there's nothing in sort of the traditional language goodness column that you would be like, well, we just don't need that in HPC. It's like you really want as much of the goodness from traditional languages as you can get. And I've already alluded to this, but on the features unique to HPC side, you have, you want the ability to express parallelism, right? What should run simultaneously with other things? And then you also want the ability to control and reason about locality. Where should data be placed on the system? Where should things run? How do those relate to one another? Um, because, you know, frankly, that's what makes things scalable or not on these large scale systems. All right, so these themes of parallelism and locality will come up um, kind of throughout the talk today. Um, and the first place here is, I'm gonna look at stream triad which um, if you're not familiar with it, is basically kind of the simplest semi-interesting program I can come up with, right? And it's, the reason it's interesting is because it's, it's so simple that 
you've probably all done something as simple as this in your programming career. And at the same time, it sort of brings to light the fact that we have to worry about parallels and we have to worry about locality. So if you're not familiar with this benchmark, uh, basically we're taking a vector C in red here, multiplying it by a scalar alpha, adding it to a second vector B, and assigning it to a third vector A. And if you've done any parallel programming at all, you know that this is what we call an embarrassingly parallel or pleasingly parallel computation, because we can just chunk those, uh, those vectors up and have each task or process or thread or whatever our unit of parallelism is do its subsection of the problem. And so a picture of this, like this might show what you might do on your desktop multi-core system where you, know, you sort of have maybe four cores, each one's doing a quarter of the work, they're all sharing the alpha. Now for on an HPC system, we make a small change to this, we'll uh, use red lines to show that we're now in distributed memory. And um, we're gonna give each of the compute nodes, if you will, its own copy of alpha. So they're not always communicating over to figure out like what's that alpha variable that lives you know, maybe on just one node originally. Um, but it still relates the same picture. And then of course, the reality we're all living in today is it's both shared and distributed memory. And so you end up with this blend of, um, you know, the hard lines indicating kind of different compute nodes in red, and then the soft lines showing multi-core in blue. All right, so again, kind of completely pleasingly parallel computation. Um, the reason we care about parallelism is we have to say, how do we want to chunk up the work? And the reason we care about localities, is we want to say like, well, which task owns which items and where do they live in terms of the memory? How do we distribute these vectors across distinct memories, things like that. So if we look at this example in traditional um, HPC programming notations, what we see is, even though this is a completely trivial example, um, the ways that we talk about this parallelism and locality are just so different from one model to the next, right? So um, the first one we'll look at is MPI. Code here is a little bit of an eye chart, but the real thing isn't to look at the code in detail, it's to see um, it's a decent amount of code. The red here is the MPI. There's not very much of it because there's not much communication that needs to happen here. It's kind of startup and teardown kind of stuff. Um, the green code over here in the lower right is actually the stream triad. And all the rest is basically just kind of boilerplate C SPMD style programming. All right, so, you know, not too bad. And if we look at um, doing the blended distributed and shared memory, we might mix in some open MP. So I'm showing that here in blue. We annotate some loops to say, hey, these loops can run in parallel within a process. Um, so, so you can do it that way. And if we're running on a system with GPUs, we might say, well, let's do some CUDA. And this is the CUDA version of Stream. Uh, the CUDA related stuff is in purple. And what I, what I want you to take from this is, you know, again, simplest program possible, need to talk about parallelism locality. And the ways we're doing it in these three different notations are just vastly different from one another in terms of the semantics, the concepts, the terminology, uh, the syntax. Um, and I, that's the kind of thing that makes me feel like HPC programming is annoying and, and not productive. All right, so again, this is a very trivial parallel computation. Imagine anything that was actually interesting, right? Your science application you're trying to do, something that involved communication or sharing data in interesting ways or synchronizing or things like that, right? These differences only become more pronounced as you get into those kinds of things. Um, so the challenge to us as a community and to us as the chapel team is, can we do better than this? And our answer is yes, we think we can. Um, so this is uh, in the middle here in blue, this is stream triad and chapel. And this is essentially the moral equivalent of the MPI plus OpenMP code I showed you before. And I've left out one expression here in the interest of space, but it's, it's not like I have hidden dozens of lines of code. This is like a, an expression that fills the rest of the line or maybe wraps onto a second line, um, which just says, how are we gonna map this computation down to the system? Um, so these two are equivalents, uh, the chapel code and the MPI OpenMP code. And on the right here, I've got a performance graph. So higher is better. It's going up to 256 nodes with 36 cores per node. Um, we call nodes locales. So that's something you'll need to get used to in this talk. Um, so what does that bring us up to? That's like 9,000 some cores. And this is plotting three versions, the reference version in green and two chapel versions in blue. And what you can see is they're all basically superimposed, which is this is a memory bound benchmark and we're all doing as good as the memory can on this system, right? So, you know, more concise, more clear, I would argue, and yet good performance. And I'm not gonna go through this code right now, but by the end of the day, you'll understand this code if, if it isn't immediately intuitive to you. Um, here's a second benchmark. This is the HPC random access benchmark. This one's a little more interesting. You basically have a distributed table and you're just randomly updating random locations with random values. It's kind of like, how hard can you just pound on random memory all over the system as fast as possible, if you will. And I'm not gonna go through this one in detail either, but 
You can see sort of a lot more red in my MPI code here. That's because there's a lot more communication. Um, in Chapel, the equivalent of this MPI code that I've pulled out of the kernel here is this nested loop. And this is a case where Chapel not only um, is more concise and clear, I would say, than the MPI code, but in fact, just blows away the performance on a Cray XC. And the short answer for why this is, is that um, the MPI code is saying very specifically, here's how I want you to do the communication. I want you to buffer in this way and send in this way and receive in this way. And the Chapel's code is saying, we've got a bunch of updates we want to do to this distributed table, and you can do those in parallel. And we're going to do them atomically, by the way, which is what this .xor is. And that gives the compiler a huge amount of leverage to say like, OK, well, I can do all these operations any way I want as fast as I want. And the atomics on the Cray are something built into the network. So that gives us an advantage. We can, we can make use of this nice network capability through the compiler. Um, whereas in MPI, if you wanted to do that, well, first of all, I'm not sure you could do it in MPI, although I'm not sure. Um, but in any case, you'd have to change the code because you're no longer doing sending and receiving. You're like talking to this network um, uh, atomic memory operation interface, right? So basically, not only this is one of the examples I was talking about earlier. Not only have we made the code shorter and cleaner, easier for a human to understand, we've made it easier for the compiler to understand and therefore to optimize. Um, and this gets back to Kathy Yellick's point about um, you know, raising the level of semantics both for humans and for compilers' sake. Um, one other uh, example I'm going to give, this is maybe not as well known as my previous benchmarks. This is the Bale Index Gather benchmark. Um, this is kind of like random access. You're, it's also sort of random system-wide access, but you're doing sort of a gather from one vector using a permutation vector. You can think of this being into another vector. And this is a pattern that um, the Bale team who, who developed this, they don't like the term benchmark, this uh, computation, if you will, has been working hard on creating abstractions in C, C++, Shmem that make this like not too ugly and perform well. And so two of the technologies they have are called X stacks and conveyors. Um, so these are not as low level as like the MPI I was showing you previously. These are building on these nice libraries that they've developed. But you can see, see it's still a decent amount of code. Um, these are how we'd express it in Chapel. The first one is kind of our elegant version, which the compiler can optimize if you throw an optional flag. The second one is kind of a manually tuned version where you don't need that optional flag. And over here on the right, again, a performance graph. Um, all the blue lines here are Chapel. The green lines are these X stack and conveyors versions, so the reference versions, if you will. And you can see this is another case where our, our best tuned versions basically are um, you know, competitive with and beating by a slight amount the reference versions, yet again with code that I would argue is sort of cleaner and more natural. And these bottom two lines are sort of if you turn off some of these optimizations, kind of what would happen without the optimization. So not, not cases you'd actually see in practice very often. Um, uh, Fred? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but I think no, we no. have a question into Great. Have, I was just about to raise their hand. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hi. Hi there. Um, so I guess I'm what you call a scientific application <laughs> programmer more on that side. So okay. um, I was wondering, is the performance improvement you see by using Chapel just because it can take advantage of create architecture? Or if you run it on something else, you'll also see the same performance increase? Yeah, that's a really good question. So going back to my RA slide. This RA slide is a performance graph that's very specific to Cray's because of uh, taking advantage of those atomic memory operations that the network supports. If we were to run this on, say, an InfiniBand machine or something like that, um, where I, I don't believe that InfiniBand supports atomic memory operations to the same degree that Cray's do, but even if it does, we're not actually taking advantage of them today. Um, what you would see is probably these lines much closer together. So this code would still work. Um, we simply would implement the atomics using other mechanisms rather than the network. So this is a case where you would see a very different graph on a non-Cray system. Um, for this index gather, um, to the best of my memory, this is not particularly... So, so Crays are good at fine-grained access. And in fact, these bottom lines down here are sort of lines that you would get if you just did a lot of fine-grained access. And so those lines are better than if you did a lot of fine-grained access on an InfiniBand system, because Crays tend to do better than that. Um, that said, Aries is getting old, so maybe it actually would be pretty neck and neck. I'm not sure. But these top lines are actually being done because of aggregation. And aggregation is a technique that works well on any system. So th this is a graph that I believe is pretty indicative of what we would see on non-Cray systems as well. And um, in recent years, particularly since the HPE acquisition, we've been focused a lot more on uh, improving performance for non-Cray networks, um, InfiniBand specifically being a big target. 
Um, so there's been a lot of great progress there in the past uh, couple of years. And um, Elliot Ronahan, who's one of my colleagues who's on the call, um, does a lot of our performance work. Uh, he and Engen uh, are responsible for a lot of the work I've been showing here in these graphs. Let me just pause and see, uh, Elliot, anything you want to add to that characterization or anything I got wrong? No, I think you summarized it well. Yeah, for these aggregated graphs, I would expect the same behavior on infinite band. And we have seen that up to, I think it was like 576 nodes or 75,000 cores on an infinite band system. We okay. saw a similar graphs to the one that you have up now. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yep, good question, thank you. Uh, while we're paused for questions, any other questions um, so far before I move on? All right then. Okay, so uh, if I'm remembering my transition here, this is the hardest thing about virtual talks. I can't remember what my next slide is. I think we're gonna, so you know, benchmarks are all well and good, but if all you could do is benchmarks fast and, and nobody actually cared to use the language, then that wouldn't be so great. So um, this is a slide which has our current flagship chapel applications. Um, and what I like about this slide is we've designed chapel, as I said at the beginning, to be sort of any parallel algorithm on any parallel architecture. And for years, people said, like, you should just get a killer app, and then it's game over. Like, once you have a killer app, you're done. But we sort of didn't want a single killer app. We wanted a bunch of killer apps, because we didn't want to get labeled as a one-trick pony. And one thing that I like about this slide is, at the top here, you've got what I would consider sort of traditional um, scientific simulation, kind of simulating aspects of the physical world, uh, the first being through aircraft simulation, through computational fluid dynamics, the other being the formation of universes and ultralight dark matter in astrophysics. Um, but at the same time, as many of you know, uh, HPC is becoming more and more about um, data science and AI and machine learning and things like that. And so um, some of these other things like Arcuda and Cray AI are more on that side of the spectrum. And then CHOP, uh, this optimization framework is maybe somewhere in the middle, kind of like a computer science-y kind of problem. Um, so what I like is sort of the variety of uh, applications that are exhibited on this slide. And what I'm going to do in the next few slides is just dive into a few of them, uh, just to give you a little bit more details about what's going on. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of them, but we'll hit on um, two of them. And the first one will be this Arcuda project. Uh, and let me just go to my next slide. So what is Arcuda? Basically, it's a Python library. I mentioned before how most fast Python codes are actually implemented something else. This is basically a Python library that's implemented in Chapel. And what it presents to the user is a key subset of normal NumPy and Pandas interfaces so that you as a Python user are writing code that looks more or less exactly like traditional uh, Python NumPy pandas code. But the implementation underneath is different and running on Chapel. And so this picture kind of shows it. You're the human interacting with your Python client in your Jupyter notebook or whatever. And then it's communicating with this Chapel server that's running on your HPC system, say. Or maybe it's running on your laptop. It doesn't have to be an HPC. Um, but the point is, to you, it's sort of transparently Python but then all the big number crunching is happening in Chapel. And so what is really exciting about this framework is they're computing seriously massive scale results within the human thought loop. So what's very important to them is that their data scientists can sort of massage the data or make a query or run an algorithm and have the result come back in seconds to minutes because you know, there's nothing worse than losing your train of thought because something takes way too long. Um, doing that in a familiar environment and then using Chapel and large scale HPC systems to be able to um, operate on these truly massive data sets kind of in you know, interactive rates. Um, so this is about 16,000 lines of Chapel, uh, most of which was written in 2019, but it's been continually improved since then. Um, the size of the code hasn't really changed much, but the capabilities um, have, have increased dramatically since the original uh, version. This is written by Mike Merrill, Bill Roos, and others um, at USDOD, and it's an open source project. So if this is something that sounds intriguing to you or you would like to do this kind of massive scale interactive Python, uh, NumPy pandas types of operations, then you should take a look at it. Also mentioned that they're interested in essentially making this a general purpose kind of interactive framework. So not specific to these specific operations, but something where we might say like, well, I'd like to do FFTs interactively. Let's bring in the FFT model or something like that. So that's a, a current effort of, of our team and their team jointly. And then why did they choose Chapel? Um, they wanted a high level language that gave them performance and scalability. They had to write this quickly. They wanted to be um, uh, productive so they could do that. And in addition, because they're serving Python users, they wanted the Python user who kind of opened up the hood to see like, well, how does this actually work? Or how do I add my new function? Wouldn't be like terrified by what they saw and run away, right? They wanted something that while not Python like was similarly attractive and, and Chapel fit that bill for them. 
Um, they want a great distributed array support. That's sort of the building block for Arcuda. And they want something imported from laptop to supercomputer trivially. So they could do all the development on you know, convenient machines and then run it on a supercomputer without challenges. And for the most part, that's been a huge win for them. It's been trivial for them to debug something locally and then get it running on the biggest scales. Um, this is my last slide on Arcuda, just to uh, put a performance result up here. Um, this is kind of a hero run that we recently did jointly with them on a large Apollo system. So this is an InfiniBand based system, getting back to the previous question. And this sort of just, we wanted to see like how big of a sort could we do on this system. And so we did a 72 terabyte sort of eight byte values. We got 480 gigabytes per second, which uh, means we ran that in two and a half minutes of elapsed time. This used about 73,000 cores of AMD ROM, which is you know, a scale I never thought I'd be running on when I was in grad school. And the best part of all, I think, is it's about 100 lines of chapel code. Um, so originally, uh, Mike Merrill uh, wrote this sort. He was looking at a Nestle implementation. It was kind of, how do I do a sort? Oh, this looks pretty clean. I'll port that to chapel. And then we've done some tuning of it since then to use um, some aggregators. And um, you know, with kind of a short, fairly straightforward piece of code, have gotten this really nice scalability graph. If you don't follow sorts, I don't follow sorts. My understanding, this is pretty close to world record performance. Um, although it's a little bit apples to oranges, we're sorting slightly different types of values um, in a slightly different way than they are. But I would say if it were performance for lines of code, I would be surprised if there was something else out there that was you know, this competitive at scale. So that's um, a quick introduction to Arcuda. And then the other uh, one I wanted to show you about was CHAMPS, this computational fluid dynamics framework. Um, this is a 3D unstructured CFD framework uh, for airplane simulation. It's about 48,000 lines of chapel that was written from scratch in about two years. And I, I should qualify one thing when I say from scratch, there are a lot of numerical libraries they're using through interoperability, um, which aren't included in this line count here. So it's not as though the entire thing is pure chapel. Like any good language, we interoperate with other languages. And so some of the core numerics are, are definitely done in existing uh, numerical libraries. Um, who wrote this? This is from Professor Eric Lorendo's team at Polytechnique Montreal. And the reason that they used Chapel was that it was language that was giving them performance and scalability competitive with MPI plus C++, which is the other thing they would have written this framework in. And that the students frankly found it far more productive to use. So at this point, um, I'm gonna grab a drink of water and play for you. This is a video from uh, last year's uh, CHU workshop. This is our annual Chapel workshop. And I've just pulled a two minute clip uh, where Eric, uh, the PI of this project, talks a little bit about um, the productivity impact that Chapel has had on their lab. Uh, I think he says it better than I could, and it's, you know, I'm obviously biased. So let's see what he has to say. Um, if you don't hear the volume after I hit play, shout at me. I think I've got it set up right, but, you know, Zoom. So to show you what Chapel did in our lab, I started my lab. So after my 15 years at Bombardier, I became a professor in 2011, 2012. So I wrote NS code myself, gave it to my lab. And we added physics and all this, and it ended up 120,000 lines. And my student said, we can't handle it anymore. It's too complex. We lost track of everything. And today, they went from 120,000 lines to 48,000 lines, so three times less. But the code is not 2D, it's 3D. And it's not structured, it's unstructured, which is way more complex. And it's multi-physics, aeroelastic, aeroising. So I've got uh, industrial type code in 48,000 lines. So for me, this is like the proof of the benefit of Chapelle, plus the smiles I have on my students every day at the lab because they love Chapelle as well. So that's the key, that's the takeaway. And so at uh, CHAMPS, so that's the new solver that has been made and all made by the students. And I did not program one line. I'm happy to say I, <laughs> I can't. And uh, the, the students do a, a better job that, than I do. So it promotes the programming efficiency. It was easy for them to learn. So they tell me, but I see the end result. We ask students at the master's degree to do stuff that would take two years and they do it in three months. And I'm not joking. This is like from two years to three months. So if you want to take a summer internship and you say, and I've done that in my lab, program a new turbulence model, 
well they managed and before it was impossible to do all right let me turn the audio back off yeah so um again uh i think to us that was a really exciting message to hear that like the, the, this team kind of took a chance on chapel they originally approached us saying like we want to use chapel but our advisor is worried that nobody is really using it much um how could we tell him he's wrong and we we're like well it's true, not a lot of people are using it. We're still early in the adoption phase, um, but we think you should do it. And they did, and it's paid off for them in, 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 in spades. So um, really like that quote. Uh, this is it written out in case the audio didn't work. And then um, just kind of to talk about some kind of highlights on their behalf. So they've been involved uh, in presenting champs-based results in a lot of um, their own industry workshops. And, What's exciting to me is unlike most computational science workshops I get to go to, their workshops, they actually get together and work on problems. Like they sort of have a joint challenge they're all trying to solve and they get together to compare results and performance and things like that. And what they're seeing as they present at these is that they're getting um, large scale, high quality results that are comparable to other major players in industry, government, academia, who in many cases have been investing in their software for much longer. So for kind of a smaller school like Polytechnic Montreal to become a player in sort of two years time starting from scratch, um, I think is a really strong testament to Chapel's productivity benefits. All right, so to summarize this section, um, I've tried to argue that conventional HPC programming notations are not particularly productive. They have too many different ways to talk about the key things we care about, locality and parallelism. And each one of those ways tends to be too specific to certain flavors of locality or parallelism in the algorithm or on the machine. Um, in contrast, Chapel supports parallelism locality in a way that's concise and clear and gives portable performance benchmarks and generates user applications that are productive and scalable. So that's kind of the first part of my talk. And that's the part where I hope I uh, wake you up and interest you and make you think, okay, well, this is something I wanna learn more about. And the next part of my talk will actually be showing you what Chapel is, uh, teaching you a little bit about the language um, because there's nothing worse than hearing a language talk and coming out having no idea what the language actually looks like. So that's what we'll do next. Um, but again, let me pause before we go on to see if there are any questions. All right, so not hearing any, and somebody's still with me, I take it? I hope. Yeah, we're here, Brian. Great, yeah, thanks. We're here, yeah. All right, so I'm going to move on. Um, I'm noticing that I'm doing sort of the classic thing of like, I've got two hours, I can sort of take my time. And, you know, hopefully I haven't been going too slowly, but um, I'm, I, I won't say I'm going to start going more quickly because I already go quickly, but I'm going to look for maybe a few places to cut corners here because I, I um, again, don't want to lecture to you for the full two hours. All right, so next I'm going to give you this introduction to Chapel. When I teach people at Chapel or introduce people to Chapel, I tend to sort of break the language concepts down into these five main areas, um, these sort of bluish rectangles here. Um, and sort of bottom here is the system that we're trying to run on. And what I'm going to use in this section of the talk is I'm going to use these rectangles kind of as a roadmap for where we are. So we'll start out with what we call lower level chapel. And I put that in quotes because um, it is the lower level part of chapel, but my hope is that you'll go like, well, this is still incredibly high level. Um, that's the way I feel about it anyway. Um, and what we're gonna really start with is the base language. And, and you can think of the base language as, if you took chapel and you took out all of the features related to parallel programming and to large scale HPCs and locality, um, the base language is what you'd be left with. So you could think of it as like, the C or Fortran or Python, sort of this, the scalar serial language uh, that Chapel is based on. But again, rather than basing it on an existing language, we started from scratch. And I'm going to basically introduce you to the base language through this um, Fibonacci iterator example. Not that Fibonacci is the most compelling HPC application or anything, but you know, this is a good chance to show off some patterns and, and get you familiar with some basic Chapel. Um, the very first thing I do here is declare n, which is my problem size. How many Fibonacci numbers do I want to compute? We'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, but over here on the right, this is how you compile a Chapel program. So our compiler is named chpl. Our file extension is also chpl. So here I'd be compiling that, and then I could basically run it like any other program. Uh, so let's look at what happens when I run it. The main part of the computation is this loop here. For f and fib of n, do write line apps. So this basically says, iterate over the first n Fibonacci numbers and print them out. And this call to fib of n is basically calling into this iterator that I've defined. Um, you've probably seen iterators by now. When we started Chapel, they weren't nearly as widespread in other languages as they are today. But just in case you haven't, 
it's a lot like a procedure, but rather than returning a single value once, um, it has these yield statements. And basically what that does is kick a value back to the call site, the loop in this case, and bind it to the loop's index variable, so f in this case. Um, so every time I yield a value, that's going to send it back, bind it to f, and then I'm going to execute the loop's body for that value. So I'll print it out. So like the first time, I'm going to yield 0, the first Fibonacci number, and I'll print out 0. And then once I've done that, we sort of continue from that yield, um, getting computing the next number and, and yielding that. And we keep going until eventually we fall out of this iterator, or you can put return statements in here as well. Um, and so when I do that, basically, I'm going to print out the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. All right, so that's sort of the iterator in Chapel at a high level. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you is back on that problem size thing. Um, const is how we declare variables that are immutable. They can't be changed after, after they're initialized. Um, when I put this keyword config on here, what this does is compile in some built-in command line parsing machinery so that I can override the default value that's in the source code on the command line. So here, for example, if I just run the program, I get the 10 fibs we saw before. Uh, but if I run it with dash dash n equals 1,000, then it'll print out the first 1,000 Fibonacci numbers. So the goal of these configs is basically to you know, take away a lot of the pain of doing command line parsing. Uh, you still can do that if you want to, if you have something more complex you need to parse. But if it's just simply binding values to variables, whether strings or numeric values or Booleans or whatever, um, these configs often are sufficient for what people need. Um, what you'll notice in this code is I haven't declared any types, right? I'm um, just sort of, you know, it looks very scripty. Um, but even though I haven't declared the types, again, we're a statically typed language or a compiled language. So the compiler is going to go through and figure out what those types are, um, both because we think it's really important for performance in HPC world um, and also from a type safety perspective. So um, essentially, for these constants, for these index variables in the loop, for the formal arguments and yield type of the iterator, those are all inferred by the compiler, essentially just by flowing computations through symbolically. So like we know 10 is an integer, so therefore n must be an integer. You don't need to tell me that. And then I'm passing n to fib, so x must be an integer as well. And this is sort of a generic iterator. We can pass in other types. But if I pass in an int, it's going to be instantiated for ints. Current is an int. We're yielding current, so we're yielding ints. Therefore, f is an int. Therefore, we're writing an int. Right. So it sort of flows the type information through the program at compile time. Now, there are definitely times when being able to declare types is good for documentation purposes, for library interfaces. So explicit typing is also supported in Chapel. And I could rewrite this code in that way. Um, we use the colon syntax to specify a type constraint or for type casts in Chapel. Um, so here I've basically just gone in and decorated that you know these are all ints, basically. Um, but in my slides, typically, I'll stick to the implicit typing just because it's a little bit shorter and sweeter and less cluttered. And it kind of shows off the language a little bit better. But it's important to know explicit typing is there as well for cases that want or need it. Um, what's next? We have zippered iteration in the language. So here I'm just iterating over one thing, my fib of n iterator. But there's also the ability to use this zip keyword and iterate over multiple things simultaneously where the results will come out as a tuple. So here I'm zipping over, again, my fib n call, but also this little 0 dot dot uh, less than n, which is basically um, like 0 to n minus 1. And so this gives me two indices back, that 0 to n minus 1 value and my Fibonacci number. And so then I can make my output a little bit more decorated. And when I run that program, I'll you know, have slightly nicer output as a result. And I've already guess, mentioned this on the way, but um, Chapel has these ranges built in. Um, 1 to x is basically the integers 1 through x inclusive. 0 dot dot n uh, less than n is like an open interval. So n is not included. This is, again, sort of a sugar for. Uh, avoiding typing n minus 1 all the time, basically. Um, and there's a lot of operators and methods, um, sort of an algebra you can do on these ranges, which in many cases for basic programming is just kind of a nicety. But once you get into multidimensional arrays and slicing and dicing them, um, these can be really powerful for referring to subsets of data. And the sun is getting to its dangerous part in the day. Sorry about that. All right, so that's uh, my Fibonacci example. Um, again, give you just sort of a taste of the language and start getting you used to some of the syntax. The base language in Chapel is really, really big. Like we could do a full day tutorial without doing anything on parallelism or locality. And again, this gets back to sort of the notion that there's, there's nothing in kind of modern mainstream desktop languages that people, well, maybe I shouldn't say nothing, very little that people wouldn't also benefit from and enjoy in an HPC language. 
So, you know, we've got a bunch of basic types. We've got object-oriented programming of two flavors, value-based and reference-based um, objects. We've got error handling. We've got generic programming and polymorphism. We can do compile time programming and compile time evaluation of things. We've got modules for namespaces, procedure overloading, yada, 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 right? Um, I, again, I'm not going to claim we have everything. Um, that might be actually worrisome if we did. But like, if there's, a, if there's a feature that you found really compelling in a serial desktop language, um, there's a good chance that we have it or an equivalent to it as well. Because again, HPC programmers want that too. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about the base language. Actually, let me pause there and see if there are any questions about the base language before I go on. All right, I'm either being really clear or you've decided to enjoy the sunny day that Robert was mentioning. <laughs> All right, so let's go on to the things that are a bit more unique about Chapel. Um, and I'm gonna do these two at the same time. So we're gonna about, talk about task parallelism, which is like identifying computations that should run simultaneously, and then locality control, which is talking about where those should run. Um, so I'm gonna introduce one concept before we look at some code. This is the locale, and this is our key feature for locality, as the name might suggest. Um, the locale is essentially a unit of the target architecture that can store variables and run tasks. So you can think of it as it has memory and it has processing capabilities. And on a typical HPC system, you should think uh, like a compute node is basically equivalent, equivalent to a locale, right? If you, if you have a system with a thousand compute nodes, we think of that as a system that has potentially a thousand locales we could run on. And when you run your chapel program, you specify the number of locales you want to run on on the command line. So you can use the long form dash dash num locales equals four or the short form dash nl four. And this basically tells the program, go out and interact with the system and get me four compute nodes essentially, and then run my program on it. So this will sort of take care of interacting with Slurm or PBS or whatever manages your system, get you these resources and get your program up and running on. And so in this case where I'm running on four locales or four nodes, Conceptually, you can think of it as, OK, so I've got these four locale values. And in fact, in your code, there's this array that's built in that lets you refer to the machine resources on which you're running. And we'll come back to that um, on the next slide. Um, the one other thing you need to know is that when your program starts running, uh, sort of your main, if you will, it's going to start running as a single task that's running on locale 0. Um, so it's pretty different from SPMD programming notations like MPI that people use in HPC primarily. And we'll come back to that theme a little bit later as well. All right, so um, this is a very simple task parallel hello world program. Um, basically, what it's going to do is print out a bunch of hello messages simultaneously. It's in fact racy. You don't know what order they're going to come out in because they're all being printed more or less simultaneously. Um, so the first thing I'm going to call out here is this identifier here. This is a built-in identifier that is basically a way to refer to the locale on which you're currently running. So I mentioned that um, programs initially start on locale zero. If the first thing you did in your program was to talk about here, that would refer to locale zero because that's where you're running. And specifically what I'm doing with here in this code is a couple of things. The first one is I'm querying max task par, which is how many parallel tasks can this locale run simultaneously? Or sort of like, what would be a good amount of parallelism for me to create? And in practice, you can think of this as being like the number of cores on the locale. And then the other thing I'm doing is what's my locale's name? And that's just to make the output a little bit more interesting so that um, it'll say like where I'm running. And, and you can think of this as being like the host name of the node you're running on, if you will. Um, and then the other thing here is this coforall loop. This is a lot like the for loop we saw in the base language, but the coforall basically says it's a parallel loop. And you can think of the co as meaning concurrent maybe. Um, and essentially this is a loop where each of the iterations is gonna execute as an independent task. So if num tasks here was 100, this loop would create 100 tasks, each of which would run a copy of the body and print out its message. Um, now, if I'm running on a four core system, max task par is going to be four. Uh, so I'm going to get four tasks, and I would get some output like this, right? Um, and again, you can see they're coming out in an arbitrary order because I haven't really done anything to synchronize between them or try to get them ordered in any way. Um, so they're just going to come out in whatever order they happen to run. And if I run this multiple times, I would see different orders on different runs probably. All right, now, so far what I've shown you is a shared memory program. There's nothing in my code here that refers to locales other than the one we started running on, either explicitly or implicitly. So the next thing I'm gonna do is turn this code into a distributed memory program. The way I'm gonna do that is just add a couple more lines of code. Um, the first one here refers to this thing locales. I mentioned this a few slides back. This is this built-in array that represents 
the uh, set of locales on which our program is running. So again, if I was running on four nodes, the array would have four elements. If it was 100 nodes, it'd have 100 elements. And you can see that I'm once again using a co-for-all to say, create a task per iteration of this loop. Since I'm doing a number of iterations equal to the number of locales, I'm going to create a task for every locale, essentially. And then this on clause here says, well, don't just run all those tasks here locally. I want each task to use this on clause to migrate or move itself over to the locale um, that it corresponds to. And so essentially, after I've executed these first two lines, I have SPMD style execution, where I have a single task per locale, per compute node. And then from there, they, uh, uh, they execute the code I showed you to start out with. So they're going to query, well, how many cores do I have here on my compute node? And then let me print out a message per, per core. So essentially, with adding that, you know, those two additional statements outside, I turn this from a shared memory program that is multi-core to a distributed memory program that can take advantage of all the cores across my entire system. Um, and so now when I run it, I throw this additional variable, num locales equals four, to say, uh, hey, we want to run a four locales. Um, and you can see now I've got um, 16, say. So four locales, each one has four cores. Uh, scrolled off the end of my console here, but essentially um, 16 output messages, again, in an arbitrary order. All right. So that is my um, very brief introduction to kind of task parallelism through this simple example. Um, let me just pause and see if there are any questions here before I go on. I think the next thing I've got is some kind of observations about um, these co for alls and on clauses and things like that. But let's see if there are any questions about these basics before I go on. So, so Brad, with, with some of the people on the Parsec team, Dan, with, in Dongar's uh, uh, kingdom, uh, we've got a collaboration on depend, uh, essentially dependent style programming. So, how uh -huh. do you go about expressing dependencies between tasks? Yes, that's a good question. Um, I'll have one bullet on that a little bit later on, but I'm not going to go into it a lot today. We have a couple of types of variables that have um, the, that are sort of the, the prescribed way to synchronize between tasks. One of them is atomics, like you'd have in C or C++. Um, and so uh, that's one style of sort of coordinating between tasks. But the other one that you might use in more of a dependency uh, type of computation, uh, like in Parsec, like you're saying, is what we call sync variables. So these are variables that in addition to storing a value, they store like a full empty state, which is like, is the value present or not? So it's like it has, a future? You could think of it as being future-like. It's sort of like where you would put the result of a future almost. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, when a task tries to read a sync variable, if it's not in the full state, that task will block until it is. And so it's, uh, it's a way to sort of ensure you're not consuming resources waiting for something to happen. So you can think of sync variables again as being like, the receiving end of a future, and then you would basically spawn off asynchronous tasks that would compute those values and, and put them uh, into those synchronization variables. Okay. Um, and can you attach things like callbacks or something like that? Um, we don't have callbacks today, but essentially the way the pattern often expresses itself is I'm trying to read the sync variable. Maybe you're off computing that result. Um, it's not there yet, so I'm going to block until that's full. And in the meantime, I'm not really um, consuming any resources. So when you go and write that variable, sort of me waking up and continuing execution would effectively be like a callback um, in the sense that like, like sort of that's the thing I'm going to do once this value becomes available. And I don't mean to imply that this is a, an exact equivalent to Parsec. And, and I think there are sort of trade-offs. I think we're more of an eager model, whereas futures are typically more of a passive or compute on demand kind of model. Um, we're a bit more imperative, if you will. Uh -huh. um, but I think that's probably the closest we would have to it in chapel today. Well, cool. Thanks very much. Yep. Any other questions uh, either following onto that or about these concepts I've shown you just here? All right, let me go on then. Um, so one of the things I want to make sure is super clear is that in chapel, parallelism and locality are kind of completely orthogonal concepts. And you know, I would argue, well, of course, and they should be because parallelism is about running simultaneously and locality is about where are you. But if you think about the XPMD execution model, those two things are kind of tied together. Your unit of parallelism is the process, and that's also kind of your unit of locality. So we've decoupled those in Chapel, and that's what I'm going to talk about over the next few slides. Um, so for example, this is a parallel but local program. This is kind of where we started out in the previous slide. It's a co for all loop. Nothing talks about other locales, so it's creating tasks, but it's never referring to anything other than the current locale. And then this is a distributed program, but it's completely serial. So these on clauses do not themselves introduce parallelism. So what I'm doing in this little bit of spaghetti code is I'm basically just migrating myself around the machine. 
you know, I start on the locale zero, like any program, I go over to locale one, print something from there, go over to locale two, print something from there, then do a nested on clause to actually go back to locale zero. Then I exit those scopes and I'm back on locale zero just because I've sort of popped all my scopes. So I'm moving around the machine as I'm doing these computations, which are totally boring computations, obviously. Um, but I'm doing it completely serially, right? Nothing here is saying do this in parallel. So I'm literally just walking around the machine doing things. And of course, what most interesting programs do in practice is they combine these two things, like the coferall on we saw before, or this one, which sort of um, creates a number of tasks equal to some number of messages, and then uses this little mod operator to kind of deal them out to the locales round robin. Um, so kind of a little variation on the, the previous one I showed you. Right, and I think this, this sort of decoupling of parallelism and locality is one of the key things about Chapel. And it's sort of, when you're learning Chapel, it's kind of so obvious. It's like, well, what, what other world could you possibly live in? But of course, most of us are living in a pretty different world most of the time. So a couple other rules, and then I'm gonna to return to that theme. Um, one of them is that variables, when you get to a variable declaration, that's gonna be allocated locally to wherever the task is running. So again, programs start running in locale zero. So all these variable declarations at the top of my program are gonna be allocated in locale zero. Um, so if I sort of have a schematic of my running, I've sort of allocated some, some memory for those variables here. And then let's say I have an on clause. So again, serially, that's gonna migrate my task over to locale one. And then within that on clause, maybe I declare some more variables. Well, I'm running on locale one now. So when I hit those declarations of X, Y, and Z, those are gonna be allocated in locale one's memory. Okay, so that's kind of a key core concept. Wherever you're running, any new variables you create are gonna be allocated there by default. All right, the other thing though is that code can refer to visible variables, um, visible through kind of normal lexical scoping, sort of looking up your program, um, even when those variables are remote. So in this code, this is kind of a, com another completely goofy arbitrary computation. Um, basically, I've got these variables over on locale zero. I do this on clause and then I've got some code here. If I'm not done, if I'm verbose, print something out and then you know compute something and add it into total. This is referring to these done total and verbose variables that I declared on locale zero. So they're not local, but that's not a problem for the language. The language is basically gonna take care of any communication necessary um, to make this code work on locale one. Uh, so you know, the key point here is this code is running on locale one, but referring transparently to values stored in locale zero. And again, this is a huge productivity benefit. The way you refer to variables is the same you would in any language. Like, can I see it? Am I scoping? Yes, okay, then I'll name it. Happens to live over there, doesn't matter. Um, of course, it can have massive performance problems, right? If you, if you're always referring to local things, that's gonna cost you something performance-wise. Maybe our compiler will um, do something nice to sort of insulate you from that, but you can definitely shoot yourself in the foot if you're referring to remote things all the time, right? So, you know, there's a productivity cost. I can refer to anything all the time. And there's a potential hidden cost, which is, well, am I referring to remote things without realizing it accidentally? Right, so that's a little bit of what the performance uh, tuning process looks like in Chapel is like, well, where do these things live and where am I running? And are those things in the same place? And how could I improve that? All right, so I've kind of alluded a few times to kind of Chapel being deceptively simple. Um, let's actually just point out exactly how simple it is compared to sort of the status quo, right? So when we teach people Chapel, particularly people not coming from HPC, they're like, yeah, this all makes sense. It all seems intuitive. When we show it to HPC people, it's so different from what they're used to, they feel suspicious of it, which is why I start with those performance graphs and testimonials and things like that. And so let's compare kind of a chapel program to the SPMD equivalent. So this toy program, like all my programs that I've been showing you in this section, pretty artificial. Uh, I wanna read in a variable from the console. I'm gonna print out a little message. I'm gonna then have every locale kind of do a little computation on that variable. And then I'm gonna print out a message at the end, right? So you know, from what I've shown you, if I gave you this code, I think hopefully most of you are like, yeah, I understand what that's doing. So let's look at how we would write that in an SPMD world. And in fact, it's, I, I don't, I've written so little SPMD in recent years that I had a bug in this till the last minute last night. I probably still have another one, I don't know. So some questions I'm gonna ask along the way. Let's say you need to do something on just one node. How do you do that? Well, in Chapel, you just do it. It's like your task is only running on one node by default. So just write the code you want to run. In an SPMD world, everyone's running their own copy of main. And so you have to kind of put in this filter, like, well, let's make sure that only one of the processes are doing it, right? So it's kind of like turning programming inside out. Like rather than saying, this is what I want to do, you want to say, well, I don't want everyone to do this. I, only this guy should do it. So I have to put this, this conditional in here. Not a huge deal. We've all gotten used to it, but like kind of backwards for anybody who hasn't been living in this world, I think. All right, 
Let's say you want to ensure that one thing finishes before the next one starts. Well, in Chapel, for the most part, our statements kind of have more or less sequential semantics. Like you execute the one, you execute another. They might introduce parallelism, but it's like there's sort of a, a logical flow to the computation. And we haven't really talked about this, but one example of that is a co for all by default, all those tasks uh, we're going to wait. The original task is going to wait till all the tasks have completed in the co for all um, before it proceeds. So there's sort of a logical like, yeah, now we're all done executing that code for all, let's go on to the right line. Um, so this right line will never race with the right lines that happen within the code for all. And this is the bug I had to the last minute last night. I didn't have this barrier here. And so you could have had this race where like, um, <coughs> some of the nodes were still printing things out and then node zero got through and printed out the buy message. <coughs> so again, obviously I can fix that with barrier. We've probably all been trained to do that, but Man, what a kind of backwards way to program. You want to refer to a remote variable. We already talked about this. In Chapel, if it's in your lexical scope, you can just name it, parse in MPI or SPMD kind of things. You have to do some sort of communication typically to get at that. Here I'm using a broadcast to get the value of X that uh, process zero read in from the console to everybody, and then they can print it out. Maybe you need some additional parallelism. Um, in Chapel, all of our parallel features are kind of composable. You can have co for alls within co for alls. And, you haven't seen many other parallel things yet, but you can sort of nest them arbitrarily, kind of completely independent from the hardware resources. It may have a performance impact, but like that's the way you program. Whereas of course in SPMD, again, your unit of execution is also your unit of parallelism, unless you start mixing in OpenMP or pthreads or CUDA or something, and then you're back in the like, well, gosh, we're mixing lots of things together kind of world. All right, so um, that's kind of my little sidebar about, this is sort of what I say, deceptively simple, right? Like, of course it works, but when you think about the SPMD world, again, everything's sort of flipped inside out compared to what I would say most programmers not working in HPC are used to. So, and, so Brad, can, oh, can I yeah. inject a quick question there? So, so yeah. in the SPMD version, you're using a broadcast that could asymptotically be much more efficient. So what, what's the ability of the compiler to basically take your access of X and realize everyone wants it and replace it with a broadcast? Uh, well, uh, so what would happen here in this chapel code is that, so, so you're right, the, the, there's sort of a broadcast happening implicitly, right? Because all of these guys are referring to X, all of my locales are referring to X. Um, what happens here in practice though, is the compiler looks at this code for all and says, I see you're referring to X in here. And I can see that nobody else is reading or writing it simultaneously. So I know it won't change during this. And so in the process of spinning up all those remote tasks, um, let me, give you a copy of X, like while I'm saying like, hey, Robert, mm -hmm. you need to run this right line. I'm going to give you X at the same time. And so the cost of communicating X in this case is basically amortized. Now you could ask a mm -hmm. similar question, which is, well, that cost of spinning up all those tasks is explicit in Chapel. And if I'm sort of creating and destroying them all the time, maybe I'm paying a ton of uh, overhead to sort of create and destroy tasks. Whereas in SPMD, I sort of amortize that at the beginning of my code, and then they're running for all time. And this is something we worried about a lot in the early days too. But if you remember back to that stream example I showed you, um, going up to what was it, 9,000 cores, um, the two chapel versions, I, I didn't really describe them. One of them basically times that spinning up the tasks loop and the other one doesn't. And if you remember that graph, they're basically more or mm. less on top of each other. And uh. what that says is like, you know, we've all been taught like, don't communicate, um, you know, avoid communication at all costs. But the fact of the matter is, this has been an interesting lesson for me to learn because I came out of that mindset as a grad student. Like there's a, computers are super fast. Like you don't want to do unnecessary communication, but spinning up a bunch of tasks really doesn't take that long mm -hmm. if you're doing anything meaningful in your computation. And in HPC, we typically are. So the cost of spinning up those tasks is nothing. And I think the benefits in terms of programmability are, are you know, immeasurable basically. Cool, thank you. Yep. Um, any other questions while I've paused? All right. Um, the last thing I want to say here is, you know, I've been arguing sort of Chapel versus SPMD, but of course you can do SPMD programming in Chapel. So, right, like I could make the very first statement in my program be this co for all local locales on loc do, and then just kind of program it in SPMD style for the rest of my program. So it's not as though we have removed SPMD from your toolbox. It's just that we haven't necessitated every program must be SPMD. And in fact, if you look at the champs teams code, it's a lot like MPI transliterated into Chapel. Um, it's still very explicitly SPMD. 
rather than doing sends and receives, they're basically just copying buffers around through the shared address space. Um, but stylistically, the code is still very SPMD in style. And again, you know, no shame there. Like that's what they're used to. It fit them well. Um, so you know, why not do it that way? Uh, yeah, they're still seeing massive performance benefits compared to doing it in C++ and MPI. All right. Um, this is kind of a roundup of some other task parallel features just for the sake of completeness, not things I want to teach you today. We're running later than I would like. So I'm just going to kind of flip this up and say a couple different ways to create parallelism other than coferalls, a um, couple of ways to synchronize. This gets back to Robert's question about how do we coordinate between tasks. And then um, some task intents, which are useful to know about if you're doing this style of programming, which is basically about sort of governing um, different ways in which uh, variables in outer scope sort of make their way into the tasks that uh, implement um, coferalls or other task parallel features. So again, just kind of name dropping these so you know they're there, but not intending to spend more time on them at this moment. So um, this is going to be sort of a transition from kind of the low level features to the higher level features. So another good place for me to pause and just check if there are any questions before we go on. All right. So again, my hope is in seeing this, you'll be like, so, so why do I say that stuff's low level? It's low level because you're talking very explicitly about create me this many tasks, run them here. Uh, um, and a lot of chapel code doesn't actually work that way. So, so that's low level because it's very explicit. Next, we're going to look at high level stuff, which um, essentially abstracts a lot of that away. And so we're going to look at these two sections, domain maps and data parallelism simultaneously. Uh, again, using a very simple kind of toy program, but one that'll teach you some basics. Um, so this is basically just creating an array and filling it in parallel. Uh, I've got my problem size here again, n, which is 1,000. Um, in my picture, I dialed it down to five, so I can actually draw the picture. And the first thing I'm going to do is declare what we call this domain. These curly brackets uh, should hopefully indicate set to you. This is basically a set of indices, and specifically the set of indices 1 to n, 1 to n. So it's like a 2D set of indices. And the picture you might have in your mind is this little square. Again, I've drawn the five by five version of it. And it probably looks a lot like an array, but um, you can think of it more as like the indices of an array. It's not actually the array itself. So you can think of it as like low and high bounds or something like that. Um, one of the things we use these domains for is actually declaring arrays. So when you declare an array, uh, this is saying, give me an array A, and then the square brackets say it's an array, and then the stuff inside the square brackets say, which indices is it over? So one to n, one to n. And then we say, what kind of element type? This is a real floating point variable. So I basically taken this domain, this index set, and I've said, allocate me a floating point variable for every index inside of that. So now I've got sort of n squared storage, um, you know, all storing the value 0, 0.0, for example. Um, another thing we use domains for is in computation. So for example, they're really great to drive loops. Here I'm saying for all i comma j in D, so for all indices i j in my domain, a sub i j equals this little function of i and j. And I have my picture here for run a five by five. It just sort of fills it up with these values that are, again, a function of their row and column. Um, and then I can print it out using this right line and print out the values. Um, so if I run this program again with a, a problem size of five, I'll see this little grid of values here. If I run a thousand, I'll see a much bigger grid of values. Um, and this for all loop is going to basically uh, execute this computation parallel, but not uh, literally a task per iteration, because if I had a million points in my array, a million tasks, each computing this very small thing is probably overkill. So the for all kind of says, I want to do these all in parallel, kind of use the appropriate amount of parallelism. We'll talk more about what that means as we go. Um, so this, like my first task parallel program, is a shared memory program. There's nothing I've done here that refers to any locales other than the initial one, explicitly or implicitly. So this will run on locale zero or on my laptop um, and never use any other nodes if I don't change something about it. So again, if I want to make a distributed memory, I can do that fairly easily. Um, oh, sorry. This is the picture showing uh, all the memory for this domain and its array are allocated on locale zero. All right. So now I want to make a distributed memory. Um, what I have to do is just add these two lines here. The first one says, use this module called cyclic disk. It defines a cyclic distribution. And the second is this dmapped clause. Um, so what this says is, when I declared my domain, here's how I'd like you to map it down to the target hardware. And when I don't have a dmapped clause, it sort of uses this default dmap, which is just like allocated all locally. But here I'm saying, well, let's use this cyclic distribution. And the cyclic distribution is parameterized by a starting index, which is like, which index in this index set should be dealt to locale zero. And then they'll be dealt out round robin from there. 
And when I change this domain map in this way, it not only says how these indices should be distributed across my locales, but also how the arrays elements should be distributed and how the iterations of loops, uh, parallel loops over those indices should be distributed. So I basically made one change in this domain's declaration, and I've turned this from a shared memory program into a distributed memory one. And so specifically looking at this picture, I've said distribute this index set cyclically because the array is declared over the index set, it will also be distributed cyclically. And because I'm using that domain to drive my parallel loop, the computations will also be um, done uh, across all my locales using all of their cores, um, you know, sort of respecting the, the data layout, if you will, using kind of an owner compute style model. Okay, so again, simple change, shared memory program becomes distributed memory program. And so here's my shared memory run but from before. I can throw num locales equals four on here. Now it's a distributed memory run. The output doesn't change because this is all global view data structures, um, global view of computation. So, you know, semantically, I haven't done anything here that um, is dependent on how many locales I'm running on or which locale I'm running on. So I get the same result. I've just changed the way it's implemented by putting in that beam out clause. And I could come in and plug in a different distribution, like let's use a block distribution or let's replicate this index set or things like that and end up with very different mappings down to the hardware just by changing this one expression. All right, so that is my quick example today to Perelsman Min Chapel. Um, we've, we've seen a couple different loop styles here, and I just want to sort of make sure everyone's on the same page how they are distinguished. We, we started with the for loop. This is just a serial loop like in most languages, although the syntax is different. Predict, predictable serial execution order like what you're used to in anything else. We, at the other end of the spectrum, we saw the coforall loop. This is one where every iteration is executed by a distinct task. And because of that, the different iterations can synchronize between each other. So these like um, blocking patterns that we were talking about with Robert earlier, you could have different iterations kind of waiting for other iterations to compute something or finish or whatever. That's not a problem because each iteration is a separate task. In the middle, we've got these for all loops. And as I said, these are a little bit more vague by definition. They say these are going to be executed in parallel by one or more tasks in no specific order. Um, and what's going to happen in practice is the thing you're iterating over basically decides how things are mapped uh, down to the machine. So like if I'm implementing, sorry, if I'm iterating over a range or just a local domain or a local array, um, by default, I'm just going to use uh, the, the heuristics for all those iterators is, well, we're just going to use the local cores, chunk up the work across those cores, and sort of get it all done. If I iterate over a distributed array, the heuristic is different. It's okay, well, this array is distributed. I'm going to use all the cores across all the locales that own a chunk of this array. And then the other thing that's really important to know that we're not going to be talking about much today is you can write your own parallel iterator. So if there's some parallel tasking or work decomposition algorithm or something that you would like to basically write up using coforalls, non clauses, things like that, you can put that into a parallel iterator and then use a for all to invoke it and sort of basically make that recipe for how do we want to do this parallel distributed execution. Kind of reusable just like procedures are reusable in straight line code um, so again key point here is how many tasks is used where do they run well it all depends on what you're iterating over and and each thing has its own heuristic which is you know presumably correct or appropriate for that thing um, in between here we've got a loop we're not going to see today the for each loop this is kind of between the for and the for all loop it also says that um, the iterations are parallel and executed in no specific order but it doesn't create any new tasks. So this is a way to say, this is a parallel loop, but let's not spin up a bunch of threads or tasks over it. Um, so it's a loop that would be good for vectorization, or if you're running on a GPU, like maybe it'd be a good, good fit for the GPU. So kind of a lighter weight parallel loop, if you will. And those are the styles of parallel loops. And this is a place where I think I'm going to start cutting some corners. So let me pause here and say, are there any questions about what you've seen here in data parallelism so far. Uh, well, not really a question, but a comment. I think it's it's really good explained. It's it's clear to understand. Do you have kind of a, a cheat sheet with all the like commands used in Chapel? Because it's hard to remember all of them. Yeah, there is. So, I mean, one cheat sheet will be that'll be good is getting a copy of these slides, um, and then the things you've heard about, you'll you'll be able to refer back to easily. But we do have a quick reference document um, that's available on our. So we've got a documentation website online that has sort of, you know, thousands of pages of documentation probably at this point. But then one of those is kind of a quick reference sheet, which is sort of a two-sided sheet that has a lot of just little kind of reminders of idioms and syntax and things like that. 
And maybe someone on my team could paste a link to that into the Slack. Okay, it's already there. Great, thanks. Okay, cool. Any other questions? All right, let me tell you uh, what I'm gonna kind of fast forward through. Um, we can either come back to it later if there's interest in time, or uh, you can look at it offline when I make the slides available. This next section was gonna kind of, again, sort of talk about um, Chapel's view versus SPMD, but in sort of the data parallel setting, using this three-point stencil example where um, sort of the argument is kind of, Chapel writes things like three-point stencil on, on data parallel types like arrays and for all loops very clearly. Um, in SPMD, you have to do a lot more work to decompose things. And this is kind of the picture version of it. And then I sort of show the code that you'd have to write um, where there's just a lot more details in the SPMD world. So, you know, this is me, basically me beating up on the competition some more again. And then I had a second data parallel example, which was a Jacobi iteration. Um, this uses a lot of things we already saw in my simpler example. There's some domains up here, some arrays here, a for all loop here. But it sort of uh, allowed me to show off some other things like reductions, which are ways to collapse arrays or array expressions down to a singleton. Um, things like slicing, which is when you index into an array using another domain. Um, and that's a way to kind of refer to a subarray of elements. And so this section basically goes through some of these um, things that we didn't see in the previous example um, in the context of Jacobi, which is, you know, I think for many people, a pretty familiar parallel computational pattern. Uh, but again, in the interest of time, I'm going to just fly through that. Uh, but again, uh, you can look at that offline or we can go back to it later. Uh, there's a little sidebar here, and then I get back to Jacobi. Lots to say about Jacobi. And then this is kind of my wrap up of the data parallel features section. So in addition to the things I just flew through in Jacobi that you didn't really get to see, um, we've got scans, which are parallel prefix operators, um, user find parallel iterators, which I mentioned, and also the ability to write your own reduction and scan operations. And then um, most of the time in these kind of talks, we're focused on kind of dense rectangular arrays, 1D or multidimensional. Chapel also has strided arrays and domains, sparse arrays and domains, and associative or like key value dictionary style domains and arrays. Um, so it's just good to know that those are out there. Um, these are all designed to support for all loops and distributions and things like that as well. Um, so this is my summary of teaching you about Chapel. Hopefully what you've seen in this kind of brief uh, tour is that Chapel supports a very rich set of language features. We've got a very modern and productive set of base language features, such that for a lot of us, even if we're not doing parallel programming, we really like to do coding in Chapel um, compared to most other languages we get to use. Um, it's got these low level features, quote unquote, for creating tasks and saying where to run them on the system and a global namespace, which allows us to refer to data lexically, whether that data is local or remote. Um, and then we've got these high level data parallel features, which allow you to express things without really talking a lot about locales or tasks in your program and sort of the abstractions take care of that for you through for all loops, uh, distributed arrays, promotion, which is something I, I blew past pretty quickly here. Um, and again, the hope is that a lot of users will be able to work in this high level uh, subset. I would say Arcuda spends most of its time sort of at this high level, although there are some algorithms that they go down and do more SPMD like. Uh, again, Champs uses more of the SPMD level features. Um, but yeah, that's your, your brief tour of Chapel. So, um, oh yeah, let's do this side and then I'll pause for questions. So, you know, again, I'm obviously biased. I think a lot of times when we're giving these talks, people are like, this all sounds really great. Like, surely there's a catch. And so this is my side where kind of truth in advertising, like I don't want to imply everything is always perfect. So we do think Chapel is great, but at times it can be frustrating to us or to users. And so these are some of the most common points of frustration. Um, our compile times are really slow. First time you compile something, it probably won't bother you much, but if you're really in a debug development cycle, the compile times can really kind of eat at you. Um, this is something we've uh, just in the last six to 12 months, we've started a new initiative to really focus on this and work on improving them. So there's, you know, there's reason to believe it'll get better in the future, um, but today it can be kind of painful. But, um, but Brad, as yeah. I turned up, how would you compare that with say heavily templated C++, even worse or comparable? I would say it's pretty comparable. We've mm -hmm. definitely had people who we've gone in kind of apologetically like this and they're like, oh, you know, I do really heavy, heavily some templated C++ and it seems kind of the same to me. I think that's mm -hmm. accurate. Once your program is big, that's accurate. I think what's, where it's most frustrating is if you write a hello world and compile it in Chapel, it still takes a really long time. And the reason for that is we implement a lot of Chapel in Chapel and we recompile mm. a lot of that every single time. And so even though your program may only be one program, there's like thousands of lines of Chapel behind the scenes that are getting compiled. And that's where people get more frustrated.
but I would say even, even in the large scale programs where maybe it is more comparable to C++, there's still a sense of like, well, I don't like the C++ compile times either. So really, you know, <laughs> you just make it better, please, right? Okay. So that's what we're working on. Um, the next one is about like, like a lot of uh, new languages. When you write correct code, things typically work well. Um, when you write incorrect code because you're learning the language or you've made a dumb mistake, sometimes the error messages can be really confusing or poor. This is another area we're working on uh, improving. And certainly if you come across such an error message, we always appreciate you asking about it, both to get clarification so we can help you get unstuck, but also so we can highlight it as one we should improve. On the third one, on modern HPC systems, everyone wants to know, do we target GPUs? Um, even though I've got that any parallel algorithm, any parallel hardware uh, motto that we're striving towards, this is something we haven't gotten done yet. There's been a lot of exploratory work here and proof of concept work. And people use GPUs with Chapel through interoperability, but like there's no way to write a Chapel, well, I should say until our last release, there was no way to write a Chapel for all loop that targeted a GPU. Um, we now have a very nascent ability to do that, but it's still in its very, very early days. So it's really more at this point a proof of concept than anything. But again, one of our major initiatives at this point going forward. And then um, sometimes you write code that seems completely reasonable and maybe is completely reasonable. And sometimes the performance is bad. And um, again, when we find those cases, we're trying to improve them. Um, I think there are a lot of cases that are working great these days, but it's, it's not impossible or, or sometimes even difficult to like fall off the well-trodden path and, and do something that makes everything go out the window. Um, and the last one here is tools are lacking. So if you're used to kind of a rich set of debugging and performance analysis tools, we have a little bit there, but not nearly as much as you would want or need ultimately. And this is something that, frankly, we don't have initiative working on. So this is sort of future work still. Um, so you know, the bottom line here is Chapel is a continually improving work in progress. And depending on your needs and personality, it may be perfect for you today, right? The Champs team, it's where the, it needs to be for them. Arcuda, same thing. Um, if you were very high maintenance type of user and needed everything to be perfect, which you know, not many of us in HPC can afford to be, I guess, um, it might not make sense for you to use Chapel today. Um, but if you're a little bit more rough and tumble, like willing to roll up your sleeves, um, talk to us when things go wrong, you know, it's definitely possible to, to do great things in Chapel today. And I just want to call out here, I think our team has a really good reputation for being very responsive to users' questions and needs. So um, if you're nervous about this, you know, try engaging with us and see if, if the level of interactivity helps you. Because a lot of these cases, like the bad error messages, the bad performance, are things we can help with when users run into them and get you past them. Like you, you're not sort of blocked forever or anything like that. Um, and then the last thing here that's a catch is, you know, any language, however great it is, has major, major social challenges to overcome to get adopted. And I would say the HPC community specifically is incredibly skeptical of new languages, in part because they're very performance centric, like performance is all that matters, and hardware centric, like snazzy new hardware always turns heads, software sort of gets short shrift, I think, in our community. Um, and in part because a lot of people have claimed to do this or want to do this in the past and have kind of fallen short. Um, so there's a lot of, I think, you know, history here to overcome. Um, that said, uh, I think that the number of HPC focused languages needs to be greater than zero, particularly as our, as our systems get more and more complicated. And I think Chapel is as strong a contender as any. In fact, it's hard to think, you know, who else really ought to appear in this list of contenders for, you know, productive HPC language, if you will. All right, so let me see if there are any questions about anything I've talked about so far, the whys and hows of what we're doing with Chapel, the language itself, and, um, and then we'll make a decision point about how to use our last half hour. Hey Brad, can I add something real quick, Engin here? Of course, yeah. Engin's a uh, member of my team, go ahead. Yeah, when you were talking about compile times, especially for, for Hello World, you said it takes a really long time and I felt kind of defensive about it. Okay. Uh, it takes like around five or to eight seconds or something, which right. I'm not defending that it's reasonable. But right. really long could also mean go grab a coffee long. So it's definitely not like that. I just want that's, to clarify that. <laughs> that's a really good point. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, so it, it's like the, the complaint we often get is, again, the first time people compile it, they don't even notice that five to eight seconds. And then if they're sort of making the Hello World bigger and bigger, at some point they're like, well, when I compile Hello World in GCC, it's like instantaneous. Why is it not in Chapel, right? So that's kind of one end of the spectrum. And then the other end, um, Engen, since you're on the mic or close to the mic, um, can you remind me, like, what is the compile time for, like, Arcuda or Champs today, say? So, <clears throat> Champs have different executables, but they are in the order of minutes and less okay. than 10, but, like, okay. more than four minutes for all okay. of them. Uh, I believe Arcuda, you can have, like, quick compilation in just a couple of minutes locally, 
But if okay. you have like every optimizations enabled and if it's like distributed setting, I, I believe it's close to 10 minutes, but Elliot is a better okay. person to answer our CUDA side of it. Okay. So yeah, thanks for jumping in again. I, I appreciate you. I think you're exactly right, right? Those magnitudes are important to talk about so that people aren't imagining like a day long compilation or anything. Um, so yeah, hopefully that fleshes that out a bit. Um, any other questions here or uh, comments? Other team members want to jump in and point out something I said wrong or, or uh, wasn't clear enough about or anything like that. I have one more thing to ask you actually. Are you thinking, uh, thinking about talking about the mini symposium for applications? It might be a good thing to advertise. Oh, um, I don't think I did put a slide together for that. So what Engen's referring to is we got a, a Siam PP22 mini symposium uh, accepted. It's about um, user applications in Chapel. So it'll have four talks in it. Um, the first one will be by our team, just kind of like a what is Chapel kind of thing so that anybody coming to the session from scratch will have some context. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our future efforts there, or sorry, current and future efforts there as well. And then we've got mem um, the PI of the Champs team, the Arcuda team, and then um, Nikhil who, uh, did the astrophysics code I mentioned briefly, but didn't talk about at length today, um, will be sort of featured speakers talking about what are they doing in chapel and what are they getting out of it? Um, maybe they'll talk about some of the pain points as well. Um, but that'll be, that, that session is designed to kind of talk about, um, you know, what are people actually doing with chapel today, hearing from the user's mouths themselves rather than, you know, again, me saying everything's great or anything like that. Uh, and as long as we're talking about Cyan PP22, uh, I mentioned briefly that Chapel on GPUs is something we're currently working on. If that's of interest to you, um, Engen has a talk accepted to another mini symposium at PP22, which will be talking about our um, our Chapel on GPUs effort and kind of where we are with that. So, uh, so yeah, if you're attending SIAM and you're intrigued by what you're hearing about today, those would both be good things to check out. All right, other questions? If not, um, and, and I'm not watching the chat. If anybody sees anything in the chat, please feel free to call that out as well. Um, if not, um, there's sort of a couple different directions we could go here. Sort of the three main things remaining, and again, we've got about a half hour remaining in the scheduled time. Um, I'm happy to go over as well. If, um, you know, I don't want to assume anyone else will want to go over, but if, if you're interested in hearing more or we start the hands-on and you want to keep going, um, there's no hard stop at the top of the hour but I also kind of want to respect schedules for people who, who do need to leave. Um, so in the remaining half hour, there are kind of three things that we had ahead of us, three main things. Um, when I sort of felt like two hours was a plenty of time, where, which obviously it's not, I was thinking this might be a place to pause and do a live demo where I do some coding and kind of show you interacting with Chapel a bit. Um, we could still do that. <coughs> um, the next thing after that <coughs> was gonna be, I do have this section, um, I haven't, haven't done before about sort of how is Chapel looking on Okami uh, today? Uh, and so if, if people, I don't know whether people in the audience are more about like, we care a lot about this machine, we wanna hear about Chapel on this machine, or they're more like, eh, we don't really care which machine, we just as soon do some hands-on. That's the third thing is we could basically spend the last half hour um, doing some hands-on exercises um, where you could either sort of compile and run some of the codes you've seen so far. I've kind of put all those on the system or um, uh, there's some sort of exercise that give you some sort of seed programs that give you some basics and then they ask you to kind of do some things to complete them. So I don't know the right, right way to proceed here to see if there's sort of a, a general sense of what people would most like to do um, other than maybe have me stop talking at them. Uh, so I don't know, do you wanna, is there a way we could do, um, I mean, people could shout out what they would like to do, or we could do like a little straw poll in the chat if uh, like just sort of have people comment there what they'd like to do. If anything seems most appealing out of those three options. Nobody's willing to commit. I get, to I'd like to get hands on. I'd like to be able to at least run it. All right. Yeah, me too. All right, let's jump to the hands-on session then. Um, again, I'll make all these slides available so uh, we can come back to, you know, if there's time, we can come back to it, or you can look at them offline, or I'm happy to do follow-ups with individuals or small groups or whatever. Um, just to summarize this, uh, without kind of going through all the slides, this is a system we have not spent any time optimizing for. Um, obviously, the A64FX processors are pretty unique. 
Uh, and so, and, and they're not something we've ever, we've ever really run on until we got access to this system. So what we have in this section is some baseline performance figures. Um, before that, there's a slide just full of caveats, like we basically got on and measured things and we haven't spent any effort trying to make them better. So take it with a grain of salt. And we compared it against kind of the most similar Apollo system in terms of kind of core count, um, uh, network, things like that, that we had available. And, and what we saw there was actually a pretty big performance gap where Okami was behind um, our system. And, and then from there, we go on to some conjectures about like, well, why might that be? So again, I'm not gonna go through that, but I just wanna let you know what's here. Um, uh, and, could, and again, we can go through that some other time. Well, could you go through it like super, super fast? I mean, just like... <laughs> yeah, I'll it, try. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so here's the super, super vast version. Uh, you've heard the caveats, at least in their short form. There's a whole slide of, of the full set of caveats. These are the two systems. This is the Cascade Lake Apollo and Okami. They're both HDRIB, both 48 cores per node, but of course the processors are different. And so what we did was take a bunch of our standard benchmarks that we, whoops, that we use when measuring systems, ran them on both these systems. And um, these ratios are uh, sort of Okami over the uh, Apollo Cascade Lake. And so you can see the stream triad is great, which is kind of what you would kind of hope and expect because it has great uh, high bandwidth memory and is, you know, is completely localized computation. Yeah, but then but all it the other- be, it, it should be two or three times faster than that, should it? I mean- Should it? Yeah, the Cascade Lake is what it's like. Actually, no, that's about, three is probably about right. Yeah, so I, let me withdraw that comment. Yeah, okay. three is good. Okay. But then once we oh, get- oh, in, Are you single socket Cascade Lake or dual socket? Uh, Elliot, you on? Yeah, dual socket. Okay, fine. Okay, you were in the ballpark then, good. Okay. Um, so then you can see any of our other things which actually you know, do communication are suffering by you know, 30% to 10x-ish. Um, and so why is that? Well, here's some conjectures. So first of all, again, nobody's tried to do anything to make these better or understand them or study them. So this is just like, what do you get when you download it and compile it and run it? Um, so some guesses are, um, you know, we have a bunch of communication optimizations and code paths that perhaps uh, are reliant on scalar cores, powerful scalar cores and A64FX, as I understand the scalar cores are not that powerful, so maybe we're suffering there. Or maybe it's a question of those paths just um, aren't being optimized as they ought to be for A64FX and that with more uh, tuning or optimization or the right compiler flags even maybe, um, those could get better, right? Uh, big question mark there. Um, we have some heuristics for NUMA affinity and those work pretty well, like on dual socket Cascade Lake, for example, and on uh, large core, larger core count systems like dual socket ROMs and things like that. But you know, it, uh, A64FX is highly NUMA sensitive. So maybe the heuristics we've got aren't good enough or as good as they ought to be or need to be for this. Um, we don't do a lot with vectorization uh, in general in Chapel. We sort of rely on the backend compiler to do it. And so maybe we're getting luckier there, not doing much with Cascade Lake, and maybe there's more that needs to be done on our part or the backend compiler's part. For what is, what is the backend compiler? Um, I think we used LVM for this. Is that right, Elliot? Yeah, LVM 11. 11, okay. 11 is just starting to get trickles of SVE capability. So right. uh, you probably don't have much there. If you, I mean, the, the ARM uh, compiler is based on LLVM. So if there's any possibility of you integrating with it as the backend, and it is using LLVM 11 now, then it's got, in addition to SVE code generation, it's actually got a pretty good SVE math library. Okay. Uh, with, with, with LLVM native, uh, just plain old LLVM and also GCC, the, the lack of math vectorized math library is a total showstopper. Okay, that makes yeah. a lot of sense and sort of you know confirms one of the things we were suspecting here. Yeah. And, um, and the other thing is IB on this system is uh, seems quirky, right? So okay, getting getting good performance on the on the IB is hard. Okay. In the interim, uh, you could also um, ask Chapel to save the C output and then compile that with the ARM compilers. Yes, that would be a possibility, right? Cool. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so I think it sounds like looking at those compilers or, uh, you know, Tony was mentioning that they're bringing that code over to sort of mainline LLVM. Like, it sounds like those could be, uh, first of all, easy things to look into. And second of all, may account for what we're seeing here. Yeah. Um, last one I've got here is a little bit of a stab in the dark, but we rely on this Qthreads library. 
I don't know that Qthreads has done anything for A64FX, so it could be that we're suffering there a bit as well. From here, these slides go into kind of like, what are some things we can do to improve these situations? Some of which actually are things like you're talking about, like maybe it's a newer version of LLVM we need or the ARM compiler, things like that. Um, one other thing I just want to call out is we have some colleagues at EPCC who are studying how well various languages map to various ARM-based HPC systems. Um, and they're looking at, uh, I don't know how you pronounce this one either, Isambard. Um, so, so they're doing sort of concurrent studies here with Chapel in the loop. And so, uh, you know, my guess is that they may be the first ones to go like, oh, well, here are the problems, you know, here's some things we could do to improve things. But I wanted to call out their work because I think they're doing great work. Um, and, oh, the other thing we have here is we did some Shmem uh, versions of, of some of these same benchmarks and we kind of saw kind of similar performance to the chapel numbers, which kind of made us feel like, okay, well, we're at least not completely alone <laughs> in what we're seeing, um, which is again, not to say that both these couldn't be improved. Uh, maybe we're suffering from some of the same things that's not clear, but this was just kind of a sanity check on our part to make sure that it wasn't something that was like just completely endemic to chapel that was uh, accounting for what we were seeing. Um, and again, it could be, it could be anything, right? It could be our environment's not set up right or something like that. All right, so this is the summary. Basically some avenues for future exploration here. Um, yeah, if people are interested in talking more about these or if they're interested in pursuing one of these, um, you know, computer science people on your side, for example, you know, I think that's something we'd be interested in talking about Great. as well. Thanks, Ryan. Yep. All right. Um, since they're here, actually, let's, let me do the summary and then we'll go to the hands-on. So summary. This is sort of the summary of the whole thing. Well, we just did a summary. We don't need to hear this. Chapel's great. It's on Akami. All right, um, what else? Uh, again, I want to reemphasize we're hiring. Um, so again, if you know of somebody who'd be a great fit for this project, for this team, please send them our way. Um, you know, don't screw all these down madly, but I just want to call out our homepage is kind of the, the hub for all other resources. We're pretty active on social media. If you do social media, you can look for us there. And then as far as kind of interacting with the community, discussing things, support, um, we use Discourse, which is kind of mailing list web-based thing, Gitter, which is real-time chat, Stack Overflow for Q&A that others might care about, and GitHub issues for feature requests, bugs, things like that. So these are ways to interact with us after today if you're interested. Um, again, all these slides will be available, so you'll get these in front of you. If you're interested in reading more about Chapel or CUDA or Champs or hearing a talk, these are kind of some pointers to some, some good places. Uh, a bunch of these are on our website as well. And with that, let's go to the hands-on session and see what we can do. Um, you do have to hear me talk a little bit more before you start typing. Uh, so this is kind of your introductory stuff. So Chapel is pre-installed. Um, thanks to Ava and Tony for uh, getting us there. Um, this is the path, but the path doesn't actually really matter. Um, what you need to know is do module load Chapel like with other modules, and then you can compile and run like you've been seeing in this talk so far. Um, with any Chapel installation, there's a bunch of sample programs available. Um, these are kind of six great ones to start with. These are just uh, a very, you know, an obvious hello world and then some data parallel and task parallel hello worlds that use local and distributed concepts. These are kind of like some of the examples we saw in the, in the talk today. Um, this can be kind of a, a quick way to get acquainted with language. Um, other subdirectories under examples that can be useful are there's a primers example, which teaches about different language concepts. So if you're like, I just didn't really get iterators or domains or whatever, um, those primers can be helpful. There's a benchmark subdirectory, but you'll find things like the stream and RA examples we showed earlier. Um, once you do the module of Chapel, uh, like you've been seeing in this talk, you can compile these using chpl and the file name, and then you can run them using dash nl4, which will basically go and talk to Slurm on the system and say, you know, s alloc me four nodes, and then run the Chapel program on those nodes and sort of take care of all the bookkeeping for you. So this is a slide I'll probably come back to at the end and just kind of keep up while people are doing hands-on. But for now, let me go on. Um, if, if you find working on a supercomputer annoying because your editor is not set up right or your bash isn't right or whatever, um, it's pretty easy to install and use Chapel on your own system as well. Um, so if, if that's more appealing to you than using it on Okami, that's an option. And there's some instructions here. If you're a Mac homebrew or Linux brew person, that's probably the easiest. You can just do brew install Chapel. Um, for most other Unixy things, you can install and build from source. For Windows, you can use Linux Bash Shell or Windows Subsystem for Linux and then just pretend it's a Unix system. And there's also a Docker image if that's appealing to you. Um, and a common practice is kind of develop things on your laptop and then take it over to the supercomputer. Um, and this tends to be really easy. So, you know, 
uh, you could start on your laptop and move over to Okami if you want, or start on Okami and then when the editor or whatever isn't set up right, drives you crazy, you know, switch over your laptop and then sort of go back and forth between them. All right, so what can you do during the hands-on session? Well, at the highest level, you should do whatever is most appealing to you, but here are some possibilities you might consider. Um, so I've taken all of the examples from this talk in my slides, or at least all the interesting ones, and put them into this little slide examples directory, which has a readme and a bunch of subdirectories. And so if there's anything that's talk you were like, I want to go back to that Jacoby example or that task parallel example or whatever, um, all those codes are here and you can compile them and run them and modify them and compile and run them again. And that could be a way to, you know, start with something you've already seen and play around with it. Um, I did prepare a couple of hands-on exercises. I'll describe them on the next slide. Those are in a, another directory here, um, hands-on. And so there, there are a couple of subdirectories here for different exercises. And uh, of course, if you have sort of a favorite computation or parallel pattern that you always like to try first, you know, Jacoby or whatever, um, you can just, you know, start from scratch and do something like that. Um, if you're working with either of these slide examples with hands-on, uh, you know, probably this is obvious, but you probably want to make your own local copy of that into your directory, um, give yourself write permissions. That's all kind of locked down so that, you know, people don't, including myself, don't accidentally mess it up. Um, and so what are the exercises? Um, so there are kind of three sets of them. Or, uh, there are four exercises, three sets. The first two are from Advent of Code. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this. These are like these little crisp coding exercises that happen in December and get progressively harder. And a couple of the initial ones when I was doing them this year, I was like, these are just kind of fun, simple computations and they let you use arrays and for all loops. And you know, they're like baby programs. In any language you knew, you'd write these instantaneously almost. Uh, so I don't mean to like insult anyone's intelligence, but you know, anytime you're using a new language, there's a learning curve, right? So starting with something really basically simple can be a great way to go. And so for both day one and day four, um, which sort of use arrays and are, are sort of good opportunities for for all loops and things, I've given you a little uh, starter kit that sort of does the input and then um, sort of says, you know, fill in the logic here. And because these are part of Advent code, they've got great instructions and kind of test cases and stuff like that. Um, if you're not familiar with that, there are links to these in the readmes in these directories. <coughs> and then these are two um, examples we use in sort of multi-day kind of chapel tutorials. So they're a bit more significant, but if anyone felt they got past these easily or felt insulted by them, these are a bit more heavy duty. There's a ray tracer where again, we provide a lot of the framework, but then you fill in some missing details to put in the arrays and do things in parallel and you can do them distributed if you want to. And then a bounded buffer example, which is more back to the kind of task parallel features like Robert was asking about, sort of how do you make these tasks cooperate in a reasonable way um, that's you know correct and deadlock free and stuff. So scrolling back in that hands-on directory, you'll see three subdirectories, one for each of these. Each one has some code snippets to start with and some readme files that sort of have instructions. I'm, I'm not gonna sort of walk you through all the instructions. You've probably heard enough from me today. Um, if you need help during this hands-on, uh, so I'll continue to be here live and you can ask me a question and I'll start paying more attention to chat. We've also set up this chapel webinar hashtag on the Slack channel and other members of the team will be monitoring that. So, you know, if we have more questions than I can handle interactively or whatever, um, we can paralyze in that way. You can take them off into one-on-one -on -one conversations if need be. And again, um, well, both during today, but, but more in general, like there are other ways, these are other ways to get help. And I have those back on the resources slide. So with that, let me jump back to, shoot, I'm realizing there are kind of two main slides. So, so get these paths into your head. Maybe you use Okami enough that the, you, you sort of can guess where these are. Luster, Projects, Global, Chapel, Okami Webinar is where both the slide examples and the hands-ons are. And then the other thing is back on the, maybe that's the one I should keep up. This hopefully is pretty intuitive. To get started, you can do a module load chapel. You can compile and run one of these existing examples or you can dive into those other directories, start compiling and running those. Um, so that's kind of my spiel on the hands-on. I've left you all of 14 minutes to actually see if you can compile and run your first travel program. I think you ought to be able to using Okami. Um, you know, famous last words. But at the very least, everyone might want to try to do that if you have an Okami account. If you don't, you might try installing and building from source on your laptop. Also pretty straightforward. Um, takes a few minutes, but not too bad usually. And with that, I'm going to shut up. And what I'll do is I will start kind of, maybe I'll, sh I can't share two things, can I? I'm just going to shut up. Any questions about the hands-on uh, at a meta level? And then we'll just let people ask questions as they wrestle with things and have problems.
And I can flip back and forth between these slides if that's helpful. Questions? <laughs>